It's a great privilege uh, to be here this morning, and uh, along with my brothers and uh, sister-in-law and Glennis and uh, uh, Nola and Yvonne uh, and any other visitors that may be here. It's a great privilege to be here on this day. And uh, I was reading uh, in a very special Good News Bible last night, and uh, it said, you know, how, how God created this universe and um, at the end of the sixth day, on the seventh day, he rested and made this a special day. Have you ever wondered, you know, where the year comes from? Well, we all know that. Or the month comes from? We all know that. But where does the week come from? You know, and we always wish we had eight days, isn't it? Because it's hurry, worry, and bury in this world. Isn't that right? We always want more time. But where did the week come from? It didn't come from the Babylonians. I want to tell you, it came from God. And at the end, you know, God didn't need rest, but we need the rest, right? Because we're a stressed out generation. And so God made this very special day. And I think this is great, you know. We come together from different places, but we are family. Isn't that, isn't that right? We are family. I can never forget the days in Norfolk Street. In fact, every time I come to Wangarei with my brother, I say, drive down Norfolk Street, will you? Very special place. Because that's where the green fields and the fords and the ring roses and the dikes and you name it, goes on and on, right? That's where we used to uh, w uh, welcome one another and meet one another and, and, and worship and, and have wonderful times at Norfolk Street. Oh, the Webbers too, right? They were quite a clan too. So uh, those were wonderful, wonderful days. And so it's a privilege for me today to share something that's on my heart that I hope that the Lord will make a blessing for you today. And everybody said? Amen. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. That's better. I'm going to say, even if, you, if you had your week bix, week bix this morning, you can say amen pretty well, can't you? <laughs> now, I want to tell you something interesting. How many know where poverty is? Oh, good. I'm a graduate of the poverty school. Ah, how many know where Titoki is? Oh, good for you. I'm a graduate of uh, Titoki District High School. How many know where Watatiri is? Oh, well, I want to tell you, I went to the University of Watatiri. But the campus was on Warakoi Road. How many know where Warakoi Road is? Oh. And I went to the university out there. And you say, come on, pastor, you didn't go to any. I tell you, that's where I went to the greatest university. With my brother, we went to Newbold College and we went to Andrews University. But the greatest university of learning was in Warakoi Road. And I want to tell you, the uh, president of the university was Mary Edith Ellis. And she was the lecturer and the corrector and the guider of that great university where she gave us the big picture of life. And I don't know where I would be today but for attending the Warakoi Campus University of the Watatiri University. Because she told us things we never learnt in Parati or Titoki. <laughs> and she was a greater lecturer than I, we had at Avondale College or Newbold College. That, but she was a great and a marvellous teacher. And there are some people here this morning, Loretta, you remember my mother, right? You had better. She was the best, wasn't she? And your mother was the second best. <laughs> but that's where we went to school. Uh, at that uh, great university. She taught us that this world is not an accident. She taught us that a great and awesome God, how great thou art, right? Created the universe, the stars, the sun, the moon, and created us. She taught us many, many wonderful things. She taught us that God loves us with an everlasting love. She taught us that we were not the offsprings of gorillas, or, or monkeys, but we are the offspring or the children of God. That we were created by a loving God who wanted to extend his family. I have uh, six children. And I have, my wife and I have 12 grandchildren. That's a family, right? 
And people say, oh, you got a big family. No, no, small family. God wants millions and millions of people in his family. Isn't that right? And everybody said, what? Amen. Amen. We want a few Wangarei amens today. So, uh, so she taught us some wonderful things. She taught us at the center of history, B.C. and A.D., was the greatest event which we were studying this morning, the coming of Jesus into this world to show us what God is like, to show us the truth. She taught us how to live, how to love our neighbors, love our enemies and pray for them. And she taught us that one great day Jesus is coming again. I was reading the Australian record, uh, Basil, and there was an article there in the Australian record by a fellow Basil Ford, and I think you know him. I know G uh, June knows him. In any case, it said, why do we not hear more about the second coming of Jesus? Everybody said, what? <laughs> Amen. The theme of the Bible is Jesus, how he came to save men. But isn't this world in a mess today? This world is in a frightful mess today. This world, as the Bible says, is in a critical situation. My brother and I, you're right. I know you see it on television and all right, but you should feel the pulse in the United States when Wall Street is crashing. <laughs> you should feel the pulse in the United States when in just a, a few days, right, trillions and trillions of, uh, of dollars were lost. And this is mighty America, right? Where money speaks. And there you feel the whole uh, uh, nature, the whole feeling of the country is, where is it going to end? The financial crisis. And then not only is there a financial crisis, there's an international political crisis with war in Afghanistan, Iraq, na you name it. This is a troubled wor world. And you thank God that you live in New Zealand. Isn't that right? You thank God you're not living in Iraq or China or some of these other countries. We are very privileged people to live where we are in this age and this generation. There are all sorts of, sorts of crises. There's a crisis of law and order. And I see your new, new government, and it's about time you put a new government in. But in any case... Uh, uh, is going to bring out stronger regulations with law and order. You think I need that? You don't think they can hear? <laughs> Thank you. It's red, is that right? Okay. Is that better? Well, next time I come... Because, uh, you know, I had a nephew got married uh, last Sunday, and I've got to tell you about that. But I've got another nephew who should have been married. <laughs> but he's waiting for his younger brother to get married. And I'm sure when his older brother gets married, we'll be back too. <laughs> I'm certain of that. Yeah. So, and, and listen, I want to tell you this, right? These reflections. This is our home. Wangarei is our home. We never come to New Zealand without coming to Wangarei. What a beautiful place. Beautiful people. Wonderful place. In some ways, if my wife would agree, I would come and live in Wangarei. That's family first. And being the kind and understanding man I am. <laughs> so... Uh, but we are living in a critical age, and, and in Canada and different nations and Great Britain, there's a breakdown of law and order. There are more murders being committed in, in Great Britain and London than ever before. And this is worldwide. And people say, are you fearful to go to Israel? No, I'm safe in Israel. I have the whole uh, Israeli army protecting me wherever I go in Israel, but not in Canada. But we are living in a very critical, stupendous age in which to be alive, and we need to be wide awake. And I learnt that in the University of uh, Wataturi with a campus on Warakoe Block Road. 
and I've never, never forgotten the lessons I learned. Now, in the year 2000, I was uh, in Jerusalem at the same time as the, as the Bishop of Rome. And when you go to Jerusalem, that's an amazing city, the greatest city in the world, in my book. And so I was there when there were all flags uh, welcoming the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. All sorts of people coming from all over the world, pilgrims all over the world, to be in Jerusalem at the time of the Pope. Now I went down to the Gihon, just down below the temple area, to the Gihon Fountain, uh, which is mentioned in the Bible. But, uh, uh, any case, I was down there, and there was an American professor, and he said something very interesting. Because here were all these pilgrims, uh, you know, Roman Catholic devout pilgrims from all over the world, and here was the Pope in the city, and this American professor teaching in Israel said something very interesting as he was talking to uh, um, a man selling artifacts and historical things uh, from around Jerusalem there. And he said, you know, it's really interesting. When Peter wrote his letters, he introduced himself as an apostle, but as an elder, but never as the pope or the leader of the church. Very interesting. So I want us this morning to look at a little bit uh, of uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 because it's relevant to the hour in which we are living. Because we are living, we are dwelling in a stupendous hour. So 2 Peter chapter 3, and he says here in verse 1, he says, I want to stir up your minds. I want to arouse your minds. I want you to be awake and not asleep. That's verse 1. And he says, I want you to be mindful of the things that were spoken by the writers of the Old Testament and by uh, the commandment of us, the apostles of Jesus. So he says that. Now he says something very interesting. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. What does that title, last days, mean? It means the end time. What is the great chapter in the Old Testament that outlined human history and told us the rise and fall of nations? Daniel chapter 2. And you remember the head of gold represented Babylon. The arms of silver represented Medo-Persia. The rise, and this was a prophetic chapter. And uh, uh, the belly of brass represented Greece. And the legs of iron of Rome, Eastern uh, and Western Roman Empire. And the toes, the divided nations of modern Europe. Is that right? Yes. So today, in God's foreview of of history, because we don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, but God sees the end from the beginning. Uh, we are living down at the ten toes. We're at the toenail. So when you take your shoes off tonight before you jump into bed, you remember that great prophetic dream that we are down at the end of human history. And this is what uh, Peter is writing. He says, knowing this first, there shall come in the final days, the end time of human history. All right? They will become scoffers, walking after their own desires. Many people scoff and mock at Christianity. And yet the Christian message of love and assurance and hope is the greatest message ever given to man. And there are mockers. I was uh, in Hyde Park some years ago, and there was a wonderful man speaking about what the Bible says about Jesus coming the second time. Because you can't go to Israel and walk the streets of Nazareth or Capernaum or Jerusalem without knowing that the historical Christ 2,000 years ago walked the streets of, of Palestine. But the Bible says one verse in every 25 in the New Testament that Jesus is coming again. And he's not coming secretly. He's coming gloriously. He's coming powerfully. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. So the message of the New Testament is Jesus who loved us and died upon the cross is coming again. That's why you're Adventists, because you believe in the promise of the return of Jesus. Is that right? Yes, because Jesus is coming again. So he says, in these last times, there are going to be scoffers. So I was at Hyde Park Corner there, and there was this man speaking from the Bible, uh, the great evidence that the world has a hope and a future because God is going to intervene dramatically in world history. And there was this man, you know, and he was looking around, and he was looking, the man was preaching, he's looking up at the sky. 
Look it up at the sky. Look. He was a mocker. He didn't know that he was fulfilling Bible prophecy. And there was this great uh, Methodist preacher years ago in London called Lord, so Lord Soper. And he was speaking to, to, to a large group of people. And uh, uh, this um, uh, scoffer, Heckler, was saying, what about flying saucers, Lord Soper? What about flying saucers? And he was trying to put him off and disturb him. And he said, what about flying saucers? Again and again. In the end, uh, Lord Soper got so tired of it, he stopped and he says, we are not dealing with domestic disputes today. You didn't get it, did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but uh, the fact, you know, that, that there are scoffers. I, I see it all the time in the papers, whether it's in London or, 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 or United States and Canada, I see men scoffing. Great university professors, great authorities, digging up a little bone down by the River Jordan and saying this bone is hundreds of thousands of years old. Or down in Africa. How do they know? Well, they tell the age of the bones by the age of the rocks. And they tell the age of the rocks by the age of the bones. Now, if I had written that down on my exams down at Titoki High School, I would have never graduated. Never got my school certificate. Because that circular reasoning, you know what? Yeah. So here we find, uh, when we get the news media and these people, you know, uh, trying to attack the historical record and truthfulness of the Bible, they are actually scoffers. And this is what many are going to be saying, and this is what many are saying. Where is the promise of His coming? Since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, these scientists who are evolutionists and Darwinian uh, scientists today, they, they believed that by a great explosion, the sun uh, exploded and, the universe, and, and from a small uh, uh, amount of matter, the universe exploded and it took, took form. Well, I want to tell you, when there was an explosion out there on the farm, everything came apart, nothing came together. And when you look at the wonders of our universe, right? Because God has given you eyes to see the stars. When you think of the wonder of gravity, when you think of the distance of the moon from planet Earth, and the distance of the sun, 92 million miles from Earth, everything is perfectly designed and put together, not from an explosion, but from the power of a mighty creator who spoke and, and it, it was done. And so it's saying here that in the end time, in the days in which we are living, that many people, thought thinkers, and many people in the universities are, are saying that we are, going, we are living in a closed, uh, uniform situation. So they're going to deny that God can intervene in human history. Number one, they don't believe in God. But I want to tell you something wonderful about you, and you don't think I know, but I do know, that you have in this marvelous body that you have today, you have 66 trillion cells, and every one of those cells is a miracle. Do I have to say that again before you say amen? Nothing comes from nothing. Sound of Music told us that a long time ago, didn't they? I want to tell you about Dr. Anthony Flew. Fifteen years of age, he said, I'm forgetting this Christian stuff. His father was a Methodist pastor. He said, I'm forgetting this stuff. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my own thought. He gave most of his life uh, at uh, Reading University, west of London, and he became a great writer. He wrote 40 books. How many did I say? 40 books extolling the virtues and what he thought was the accuracy of the Darwinian theory for the origin of the universe. Forty books. He's now about 85, 86 years of age. But three to four years ago, he made it publicly announced that he repudiated these books as a fantasy, false, unscientific, and that he was wrong. Lee Stobel, he used to be a great uh, atheist and writer for the Chicago Tri Tribune, said, uh, when his wife became a Christian, he, he said, I'm going to disprove Christianity, right? Well, it's not all that easy to disprove Christianity. 
because some years ago, this skeptic said to a, a, a friend, uh, his friend, he said, I want to demolish Christianity once and for all, forever. I want to demolish the myths of Christianity. And his friend thought for a minute and he said, well, why don't you do it? He said, I'm going to. He said, one thing, you've got to walk on water. Go on, walk out, one gray heads, walk on water. He said, another thing, you've got to raise the dead. Another thing, you've got to open the eyes of the blind. Another thing, you've got to forecast 2,000 of Earth's, uh, years of Earth's history and be accurate every time, mate. He said, another thing, you've got to tell your friends you're going to die, but the third day you're going to rise again. And if you do that, my friend, you will demolish Christianity forever. We have not believed cunningly devised fables. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. The Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1947. And by the way, the other day they found a, a, a statement just where David and Goliath, the boys and girls have heard of David and Goliath, just on the hills above in the rocky fortress, they, they discovered a great fortress possibly built by King David with also a record uh, and a wonder of, uh, of a quotation from ancient history, very likely from the Bible. So, so in the last days, there would come scoffers and saying, look, nothing dramatic ever happens. Uh, there is no transcendent God, you know. Uh, everything's going to continue going on and on. But what a world we live in today. The Bible says in the end times, men and women would run to and fro. In 1956, my brother Gary and I said goodbye to our loved ones in Wellington, and it took us two weeks via Pitcairn Island, took us two weeks to get to Panama Canal City. The other day, my brother left Los Angeles, and 11 and a half hours later, not 11 and a half days, 11 and a half hours later, he arrived at the Auckland airport. And that's in his lifetime. He was a mature young man when he left this country. And so the Bible says in the end time, people will be rushing to and fro. This is a unique, this is a tremendous hour to be alive. I've got to say that again, Gary. This is a unique, this is a special, this is a tremendous hour to be alive this morning in Wangare. Amen. So he says these amazing things. He says also that in the end time, people, are, scientists, are going to deny that there was a worldwide flood. But all over the world, there's evidence of a worldwide flood. No doubt about it. We call it the deluge, right? Uh, a great catastrophe by water. Go to the Grand Canyon. That was formed by water. We have a friend, I don't know if he's a friend or not, but he lives down there in Huntley, and we saw him a few years ago and went out to his place. And he tells us in Huntley there, below his ground, and it belongs to the New Zealand government, I gather, but below the ground, many, many feet, I don't know, 500 feet, 800 feet, way down below, is a massive amount of coal. How did it get there? We walk uh, down by Mare Park and we see these trees are dying, but they never get buried 800 feet or maybe half a mile down below the earth. It can only be buried by water. And when you're driving your cars, and thank God that the cost of fuel is coming down, isn't that right? I'm going to say $2.19 for one litre. That's a bit tough even for New Zealanders. But, you know, when you fill up, you are filling up with fuel from oil sources, right? that were buried in the flood. Don't you forget it. So there's evidence everywhere for a worldwide flood. I don't know, we were down at Urquhart's Bay. Anybody been to Ur Urquhart's Bay? Uh, it's Urquhart's, isn't it? Oh, you know how to pronounce it. Uh, a bay. And we're walking along there and up there on a trail, and someone has dug a hole about that deep, and it's filled with shells. Now, when did New Zealand have the last tsunami that would bury shells like that? I don't know. As kids from Aria, king country, we went, to, by courtesy of the New Zealand government, to a health camp at uh, Port Waikato. And I can remember still, as about a nine-year-old, climbing up the great big hill. 
And they're way up, and I've never forgotten this, way up there are shells. How did they get there? Through a worldwide flood. Don't you be fooled. Don't you be fooled. And God says in the end time, people are going to deny that there was a flood. And that is true today. Now, he goes on here, and if you're going to follow me, down here he says, but beloved, but friends, we're friends, aren't we? If this service forget, uh, ends on time, we'll be friends. Okay. okay. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You know what? It's saying that we as human beings are tethered to time. We as human beings born in this world, we are earthbound. And it's saying here that the great God of the universe is not limited by time. We waited 15 minutes for that wedding to start, didn't we? And the, and, and the groom was worried. 15 minutes. But 15 minutes, or 15 years, or 15,000 years to God is no time. Do you know why? Because the great God of the universe that we worship today, He is, he is one who inhabits eternity. There was never a time, I learnt this at the, uh, at the Warakoi uh, campus of Wataturi University, there was never a time when God was not. And is that true? Absolutely. Otherwise, God's just, a, uh, just an effect, right? But God is the cause of this great universe. And so God, you know, as he looks back, uh, and we think back 2,000 years ago, we think back, oh, the time of Peter... And Jesus, oh, that was ages ago. You know, there was a stone age almost. No way. In God's thinking, that is two days. Because it says with God, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So time is no consequence to God because he, he, he's beyond time and beyond space. How great he is. But God's communicated these things so that you will never give up, up, up hope. You will never lose your patience, all right? but you will be waiting and watching for that great day. Now it says here something, for God is not slack concerning his promise. He is not tardy. <laughs> Went to a wedding in Canada. I think we waited an hour and a half for the bride to come. Some of the guests and some of the people going to this wedding left because the bride was tardy. She was in the hairdresser's shop. Tardy. God is not tardy, as some people count tardiness. But God is what? He's long-suffering. He's merciful. You know, I want to tell you what happened. When I went from graduated from poverty and went to school in, uh, in Titoki, uh, Mr. Oram, good, good principal, right? And uh, David Ellis and another fellow, I won't mention his name, were such good students, they were allowed, out of school time, to take the sheep uh, down to a new pasture. But not me, my buddy said, oh, let's take our time, let's take our time. It wasn't me, uh, let's take our time. And you know, when we got back to the classroom, the time had gone, and the principal was very, uh, very annoyed, and I tell you, this was a frightening experience. He said, come up to the top of the class. Now, he wasn't a great big man, but he could swing a strap. Times have changed, haven't they? He could swing a strap. And, and we didn't mind, excuse me, we didn't mind that the boys were watching, but the girls were at the front of the class. And they were going to see us flogged on our hands because we were tardy. Never forgot that. Never repeated it. But God is not tardy, as some people count tardiness. But God is patient and merciful. And it says he's not willing that any should die eternally. Isn't that good news? God has not got a special number of people in mind that those are going to be in his kingdom and no one else. God has opened wide the doors of heaven. And God says to us in his word, whosoever will may come. That's great, isn't it? Whosoever will may come. 
And don't forget when Jesus was on earth, it was the harlots and the drunkards who came to Jesus, but it was the religious people who said, get out of town, right? We're going to crucify you. We're going to get rid of you, right? God is a compassionate God. You weren't created by chance. You were created for a purpose. And the great purpose is you to experience God's love and God's mercy and God's grace and become a child of God forever and ever and have an abundant entrance into God's kingdom. I had only been in Canada a few, few weeks out there in eastern Canada. I went down to get my, uh, uh, some of our, our goods that had come by boat, and I'll never forget this. Uh, there was a very kind man that we had to get the stamps, you know, very kind man. And he looked at me, and uh, I, show, I think I showed him my passport. He said, you're a Canadian. I'd only been in the, in the country a few, few days, right? He said, you're a Canadian. But you know what? In my heart, what did I say? I'm a New Zealander. I'm not a Canadian. I just landed on this planet, <laughs> on the shores of this country. I, I, I'm a New Zealander. And my brother Gary, bless him, still only has a New Zealand passport. Shall I say that again? My brother Gary still only has a New Zealand passport. That's good, isn't it? No, he's a New Zealander, true blue. But what I'm saying is this. God has children who have accepted his love and his goodness. And you're not a Christian or child of God until you've made some decisions. Isn't that right? I'm just saying God's not going to force you into heaven. God's not going to force it into obedience. I tell you, Gary thanks, is thankful for me. We had a wonderful father, but he could swing a stick. And one day I saw him, and he was giving my brother his due desserts, but I didn't like what I saw. And so I went up to my father and said, leave him alone, leave him alone. Gary escaped, and I got the rest. Now, that's brotherly love for you, isn't it? I want to tell you, when Jesus came to this world, he suffered. And he bore the strokes and the hatred and humility of people who didn't know God or care for God or want God's, God's son. But he bore it for you and me that we could go free. Gary leapt out of the window. He was about four feet high. He could have been a New Zealand star jumper. But what I'm saying is God is merciful, God is gracious, God is good, and he's not willing that any of us should perish. Now as we come down here, because I'm told that there's got to be a micro-sermon, not a macro-sermon, I just want to come down here and look, notice what it says. It says, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, the coming of Jesus, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Before the nuclear bomb and the atom bomb, people said that could never happen, but it can. And America now is, is, is very wary because uh, Mr. Putin and his friends are building up a nuclear force. And maybe we're facing another Cold War, who knows? But it says, in that great day when God destroys evil and suffering and sin, elements are going to melt with fervent heat. But notice verse 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. What are we looking for? I'm not looking for the undertaker. I am looking for the uppertaker. How about you? Marvel not all that are in the graves in that wonderful day, John 5, 28. All that are in the graves are going to what? Hear his voice. And what are they going to do? They're going to come forth, right? With everlasting joy and eternal life. I was reading something really wonderful, and I've got to share this with you. Isaiah 25 and verse 8. The sovereign Lord will destroy death forever. Isaiah 25 and verse 8. The sovereign Lord, the God of the universe, is going to destroy death for? Forever. Amen. We had one amen. 
He will wipe away the tears from every eye and take away the disgrace His people have suffered throughout the world. The Lord Himself has spoken. When it happens, everyone will say, Here is our God. We have put our trust in Him. He has rescued us. He is the Lord. We have put our trust in Him, and now we are happy and joyful because He has saved us from eternal death. See, death is a big, big problem, isn't it? We can't live forever. Three score and ten years, death. But death does not have the last word for the Christian. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away. The trumpet of the Lord will sound. The redeemed of the Lord will return to Zion. Now I want to tell you, never underestimate the beauty of New Zealand. I've got to fly back to Canada on Wednesday and I've got to look forward to wintry days, wet days, cold days, maybe snowy days. And I'm not looking forward to that. But Jesus is coming again to bring everlasting days, everlasting life to those who love him. But here in New Zealand, you are very privileged people. We went out to uh, Woolies Bay, where our mother took us when we were little boys. We've never forgotten the week at Woolies Bay. Never forgotten. We were at uh, uh, Matapuri this week. I want to tell you, why would people go to Australia when they have Matapuri? Or Pardow? I'm going to say, we take it for granted. This is a fantastically beautiful country. And I want to tell you, you have some of the most beautiful scenery mortal eyes can ever see, whether it's the Southern Alps or whether it's the beauty of, uh, 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 of the Bay of Plenty, where it's a wonderful sea coast all up and down here. It is a magnificent country. This is a preview of what heaven may be like. Uh, I've got to say that again. This is a preview of what heaven is going to be like. Amen. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered the mind of man, the things that God's prepared for those who love him. And what I'm saying this morning is don't miss out. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Death is not the last word. Let me read these wonderful words. Here. There the wide spreading plains swell into hills of beauty. That sounds like New Zealand. On those peaceful plains beside those living streams, God's people so long, pilgrims and wanderers shall find a home. There the treasures of the universe are open to their study to the study of the redeemed. And as the years of eternity roll, will bring forth richer and more glorious revelations of God and Christ and His love and our happiness will increase throughout the ages of eternity. You know, uh, a young evangelist went and saw, namely Billy Graham went to, saw, uh, to see uh, Sir Winston Churchill. And by the way, I want to tell you this. Winston Churchill wrote these words, We hold in scorn those people who treat Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as myths and legends. That's pretty good, isn't it? But when Sir Winston Churchill saw Billy Graham, he said, Can you give me any hope? I want to tell you, I, this morning, in the light of what God says, I can give you a hope as long as eternity. In that land where we'll never grow old. In that land where we'll never need a dentist. In that land where we'll never lose our hair. In that land where we will have eternal youth. 
Gary's been pressing uh, mandarin orange juice to me a couple of mornings. Isn't that beautiful? You want to think what the mandarins are going to be like. And I'm sorry that the Fijoas are not ready now and instead of next April. Because you think of the Fijoas, what they're going to be like in heaven. Oh. And you think of the Tuis, you know, singing to you morning by morning, you lucky people. <laughs> you, you know, you're living in a paradise, right? And the goodness of God leads us to love him and to trust him and to walk with him. Can I tell you something marvelous? How many know John Carter? How many know John Carter? John Carter, some years ago, went to Russia, went to this great city, and this lady, Julia, was a lecturer in the University of English. And she only went to hear those lectures to improve her Australian English from John Carter. That's all she went to. She was trying to close her ears from what John Carter was saying. But John Carter says, you know, we're not animals, we're special creation. We're not the children of chance, we're the children of, of, of a great creator. There's a purpose, there's a plan, there's a meaning for our lives, you Russians, you atheists. And these meetings went on several weeks. But because her brother was a leading communist officer in the province where she lived, she dared not say, I'm thinking of becoming a Christian and giving up. But you know, towards the end of the meetings, John Carter said something wonderful. This is what he said. He said, I want to tell you tonight that your body is designed to be a temple, something beautiful, something precious for God. She listened. The great God of the universe is interested in this atheist who's been listening to these wonderful news, good news. He, and, and the God of the universe says, I made you that I might walk with you and talk with you and dwell with you and that your body would be a temple of the Holy Spirit. That thought changed her life and she went home that night a transformed person. And today, she's the leader of 3ABN across Russia today, seeing millions of lives changed through the glorious power of the love of God and the greatness of what Jesus can do. Now, we came here, and this is what I'm just closing now. We came here because Evan, last Sunday, was married to Serena. Serena has waited at least four years because Evan was a little tidy. But that's not a bad idea, is it? But he waited. And about a month or five weeks ago, Evan phoned me in Canada. And he started straight off. He said, uh, Uncle David, you know Evan? I said, Evan, you've never phoned me as far as I remember all my life. He said, Uncle David, I want you to come to my wedding. I thought, that's a long way. I said to him, I didn't even go that far for my own wedding, Evan. <laughs> he said, I want you to come to my wedding. So I thought about it, and so I phoned my brother, Moss and Dill, and I said, your son, Evan, phoned me and said, he wants me to go to, to the wedding. Why would he invite me? Well, Moss said, I think he wants you to take it. Now, that's a difference, isn't it? And so... We came and we took that wedding. Now, I want to tell you today, I made a decision. I want to tell you something wonderful. When the family of God are reunited, when those sleeping in their dusty beds are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, I want to tell you something wonderful. There's going to take a place a wedding. Isn't that right? You read it, you know. I've read the last three chapters of the book of Revelation and I know everything's going to end up right. So you can sleep tonight. Isn't that right? God is going to fulfill his promises. God is going to make all things new. God is going to banish sickness and sadness and death forever and ever. Isn't that right? Amen. But notice this. Notice this. Revelation 19. And it says, Blessed or happy are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Evan was calling me to his marriage. It was a long way to come. 
But I want to tell you, 2,000 years ago, the Savior left heaven to come to this earth. And that was a long way to come because he said, I came down from heaven not to do my own, my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And I want to tell you today, God is inviting these boys and girls who love rugby and all these other things. God is inviting these boys and young people to a marriage. And that marriage is going to be so wonderful. The table is going to be so long because there's going to be millions and millions, right? Multitudes of people, including New Zealanders at the marriage. But you have got to accept the invitation. And Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. Now, as I, as I parked outside this church this morning, I noticed one or two people parking on the other side of the road. But I noticed they weren't coming into church. Where were they going? Where were they going? Well, I can see it right there. It says laundromat. What were they going to the laundromat for? Clean their clothes. Isn't that right? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. They're going there to clean their clothes. But if you went to the owner of that laundromat and said, listen, don't forget my clothes, but I need to be cleaned up inside because <laughs> I'm going to a wedding. <laughs> okay. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that beautiful? 7,000 promises in this book God makes to you if you trust him. 7,000. And everyone is guaranteed. And I'm looking forward to that wonderful day with my sister and my brother. We stood at our mum and dad's uh, graveside there in uh, Papakura. And I want to make a covenant to be ready for that great day when I will meet my university of Warakoi campus once again. I want to say that again. I am looking forward, and as I say at my mother and dad's grave, so I'm looking forward to the day, in that great day, when I meet my professor who taught me the big picture, who taught me the love of God, who taught me the greatness and glory of Jesus, who taught me how to live, how to love, and who taught me how to prepare for heaven. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. Amen. And I know many of you are too. Because we have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. Isn't that right? What a glorious hope. I want to be faithful, friends. I don't know if I've got to wait five years or four years before I come back to take another wedding if I'm asked. But I might fall asleep, right? I might fall asleep. But I have a faith that is brighter than the darkest night. I have a Savior who is the light of the world. I have a Savior who's coming again. And at a wonderful day, the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and those who have fallen asleep in Jesus shall awake to everlasting life. We have this hope. And so we're going to sing to close. But I want to read this. I, I, I don't want to wait four and a half years before I read this again. But I, I need to read this. Where have I put my glasses? Here, somewhere. However, I'll read it anyway. Remember this. Remember this. Man cannot exclude me from his little universe. Even though he deny my existence and denounce my claim, I am still there. I water the garden of the atheist and bring his flowers to summer bloom and his fruit to autumn glory. Men deny me, men may curse me, men may flee from me, and I am still around about them. Until the very last, I will work for them, with them. And if they go to a lost eternity, it shall be through, it will be through uh, the very center of my heart's most tenderest grace. Amazing grace. Amazing love. Whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life and be in the university of heaven where we'll continue studying the wonders of God's love, greatness and mercy and his great love for you. So we're going to sing the closing hymn here this morning. Wonderful hymn. Great hymn.
and uh, 213. 213. And my friend Basil Ford is going to help us on the violin there. <laughs> okay. 213. Remember this. It is peace that you need. Heaven's forgiveness and peace and love in your life. Money cannot buy it. Intellect cannot procure it. Wisdom cannot attain to it. You can never hope by your own effort to secure it. But God offers it to you today as a gift. It is yours if you will but reach out your hand and grasp it by faith. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that in thee we live and move and have our being. This world is such a beautiful place that you have made. It could not be the child of chance, uh, but it must be the child of love and care. Thank you for our parents. Thank you for our families. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this wonderful country, the singing of the birds, the blooming of the flowers, the wafting of the breezes, the beauty of the seaside, how great and wonderful you are. Lord, Jesus taught us that you're a compassionate Heavenly Father, not willing that any should perish, but each one should accept the gift, love you, and walk with you through this life, and one day through the gates into heaven. Now until we meet again, keep us in your love. Help us to make good choices every day. And in that land that is fairer than day, as unbroken families, may we have the joy of meeting again forever and ever, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.